ideas for more panels that you would like to see either the guild present on their own or in collaboration with the society, please feel free to email me or email Greg and we will be happy to do what we can. Hello to the online audience. If you'd like to send us questions via Twitter, please go to at uh, Dramatist Guild, hashtag new play. And when those questions come in, I'll run them up to our moderator and we will ask them as they come in. Um, I think that's it. So without further ado, thank you for coming. And it's my pleasure to introduce Greg Pliska, who's the president of the society. I'm, I'm oh. the head of the, of the New York Steering Committee. He's the head of the New York Steering <laughs> Committee. I gave him a promotion. <laughs> Suddenly promoted. <laughs> but enjoy. Oh, if you ask a question, please stand up and say it loudly so our online audience can hear it, OK? Great. Enjoy. I'll be right outside if you need this. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Sarah. <laughs> well, thank you, Terry, and thank you, Zach, who's running our tech this evening. And also thanks to Roland Tech, who's had a membership here, who has uh, uh, sort of been my initial contact with the Guild. Um, uh, and, and actually, I hate to correct Terry, who just gave me such a wonderful introduction <laughs> and a promotion. But um, this is actually the second thing we've done. The first thing was not public. It was a, a songwriter, book writer roundtable. And we had 10 uh, composers from the SCL and 10 uh, book writers, lyricists from um, uh, from the Guild here in the room together, and actually a few of them are here tonight. I recognize some That's folks great. on the way in. Um, so we hope this is not just the second of our co-events, but uh, you know uh, the second of many that we continue to do together. Um, I, when Roland and I sat down to uh, talk about things we could do, this was one of the first ideas we had. Um, uh, our membership at the SCL is primarily composers, also lyricists. Uh, the organization was based in, in uh, is based in LA, has been out there for some 35 years or so, um, and has had a growing New York chapter for the last five years. There are actually a couple of the other steering com committee members here, uh, Elizabeth in the back and Mark over here. Um, if you're not, if you don't know anything about the SCL, please uh, chat with myself or Elizabeth, raise your hand back there, and Mark's down here, and Shelby Comstock, who you may have seen on the way in as our New York administrator. Uh, the organization originally worked mostly with composers of film and TV and media, um, but as we've expanded into New York, uh, one of the major pillars of membership now is also writing for the theater. So this is, uh, and, and obviously that's a... a uh, a large part of our New York population. So this is a great treat for us to be here at the Guild. Um, as I said, one of the first things Roland and I said would be great to do is a collaboration panel. Let's get some writers and composers together and let them talk about what they do. How do words and music work together? How do a writer and a composer work together to create a piece of musical theater? Um, and we specifically wanted to try to get uh, a veteran team and uh, a newer team, uh, a team who's... who's uh, old and young. I didn't say that. I didn't say old and young. You were thinking it that. I, well, well, yeah, I was avoiding it, clearly. Bye, bye. And so leave it to the writer to notice what words I'm not saying. Um, subtext. So we're... Um, it's a lesson in subtext. We, couldn't, we really couldn't be happier with the four folks we've got up here. I suggested that we actually sit composers versus lyricists. <laughs> but they chose to sit in teams. I'm going to say a few things about them. Uh, they are all um, very capable, talented, successful, and articulate folks, and very modest. So the great part about my job is I get to brag about them, and they don't have to do it. Um, Chris Miller and Nathan Tyson, coming from, from right. east, from west to east, Chris Miller and Nathan Tyson, um, have written, I believe, four shows together. Uh, Mysteries of Harris Burdick was one of the first, I guess. Uh, Fugitive Songs, which uh, earned them a Drama Desk nomination for Best, best Review. Um, the Burnt Part Boys, which is one of the first pieces I knew of you guys. I think I still have a demo CD of that in my <laughs> apartment. Um, which got a Lortel nomination for Best Musical. And just finishing its run in Atlanta, uh, this last weekend, Tuck Everlasting, um, which uh, uh, has been described as Broadway aimed. And we'll just leave it at that and see what happens. Um, they uh, have also written for Sesame Street, The Electric Company, Ringling Brothers, various other things. Um, they, uh, in their bios, they say, 
we apply for many grants and receive some of them. <laughs> um, and that includes uh, a low foundation grant, Rogers, uh, Richard Rogers, <laughs> Kitty Carlisle Hart grant, ASCAP, NEA, and so on. But that's not even as significant as the Larson grant that got in 2003. Uh, and then last year was kind of a great year for you guys. Uh, Nathan was given the Cleveland Prize for lyrics, wow. for lyric writing. It's a very, goes one the Chris Houston, one the Bredis get that award every year. And it's a very prestigious award. And then as a team, they were given the Fred Ebb, Ebb Award for Excellence in Musical Theater Writing. So they are a pretty extraordinary pair of creators. And we're very happy to have them here. Continuing in an easterly direction, uh, Lynn Ahrens and Stephen Flaherty um, have been working together for an extraordinarily long period of time, which I say not so much to talk about their age. They started working together when they were five, so they're <laughs> still in their 30s. Right. Um, but uh, few teams really, few collaborative teams maintain that kind of longevity, and it's an extraordinary tribute to their. Um, both to the work they do and to their working relationship. Uh, it began with Lucky Stiff in 1988, which uh, was revived in 1997, and there was a film version of which, which we still haven't seen here, is that right? It's right, it's, film it's doing the film, film festival. Okay, yeah. so it's heading our way, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, 1990, Once on this Island, which uh, I'm sure many of us remember, uh, got a Tony nomination and won the Olivier Award in 1995 when it was revived. Uh, my favorite year in 1993, one of several shows they had done at Lincoln Center. Anastasia, the Disney film in 1997, which got two Golden Globe and two Tony nominations, was a gold record and had the number one song, which was Journey to the... Ju Believe it or not, it was not Journey to the Past. No, it was the last film in the picture and it was called At the Beginning. And they, were, <laughs> oh, right. they were Oscar nominations, not Tony nominations. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That, okay. See, my, <laughs> like, I typed this up nice so too. clearly <laughs> and wrongly. Um, uh, and then, of course, Ragtime in 1998, which was uh, uh, got them the Triple Crown, a Tony, a Drama Desk, and an Outer Critics Circle Award for Best Musical, as well as Grammy nominations, I believe, and was revived in 2009 on Broadway. Susical, uh, 2000, revived in 2007, Grammy and Drama Desk nominations, and is one of the most frequently performed shows right now across the country. Uh, a Man of No Importance in 2002, uh, which got an Outer, Outer Critics Circle nomination, I believe, Best award. Musical. Best, Best musical. musical. Okay, good. Um, I was, I, they could have brought all the awards in, but then we wouldn't have been able to see them. Um, They're in storage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, a Man of No Importance, right. Dessa Rose, 2005, Drama Desk and Outer Critics Critic Circle nominations. Cheetah Rivera, The Dancer's Life, which also had music by other folks in 2005. The Glorious Ones in 2007, uh, Drama Desk and Outer Critics Circle nominations. Rocky, the musical, or as, as Wikipedia says, Rocky Das Musical, das Musical. Um, <laughs> which uh, premiered in Hamburg and then was, was here in 2012. Uh, Outer Critics Circle nomination, Tony Drama Desk, and Outer Critics Circle awards uh, were won by that show for set and lights, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and Little Dancer, right, which is on its way. That was last year. That was last year, right, right, that was last year. And things in the works that we don't know about. So, Lynn and Steve, I'm thrilled that you're here. Um, I'm going to try to talk as little as possible. That's probably the most talking I'll do. But a, a quick story. I did a, a composer librettist workshop at New Dramatists, which goes on every year. It's a terrific experience. It's two weeks of intense collaboration, composers, writers, performers, really taking apart how do you put words to music and put music to words and tell us <coughs> tell a story with this with words and music and how do you understand how to communicate with each other as creative artists and we spent two weeks grinding through this stuff and you worked with every every other uh, potential uh, counterpart on the other team and sometimes it worked great and other times it was a disaster but it was a learning experience and at the end of this we're all sort of wrapping up, and one of the uh, writers stands up and he says, you know, if I had had this workshop 10 years ago, my first marriage might not have fallen apart. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I thought, well, you know, there is a way in which a collaboration is just like a relationship. Um, and hopefully we'll talk not only about how well it works, but also how you get through the parts that don't work so well. 
uh, anybody who tells you their marriage is just so easy from the beginning to the end is, of course, not telling the truth. Um, and so I guess my first question for you guys, and we can take it however you want, is how did you know, going back to the sort of collaborative dating process, how did you know when you'd found the right one uh, you know, in your teams? Mm -hmm. How did you know when you'd found the one you wanted to work with? Uh, well, Chris and I met uh, in 1999 uh, in grad school. Uh, there's a musical theater writing program at NYU. And uh, uh, Chris says that day one, he saw me in my long hair. <laughs> <laughs> That's the guy. And this summer, we actually celebrated 15 years writing That's together. Great. So That's it's very great. exciting. Thank you for calling us young. Uh, yeah, well, that. Yeah. Uh, but um, I, I think it was something about... It we j magically we had so much in common immediately. Um, both of our parents are both of our fathers are ministers. We both have uh, an older brother three years older than us. Uh, we both have like a love of like folk music, and uh, and just the same kind of um, yeah. And in our class at NYU, we were the we were the only we were the youngest in the class, so we sort of immediately gravitated towards each other. And it worked out that we had like a similar aesthetic and sort of we liked the same kind of theater and the same kind of uh, storytelling that it, we just had a lot in common aesthetically and, and in our lives too, so it like made sense. Was there a moment when you were writing something together when you said, wow, this is, like, so you see each other across the crowded room and you say, oh, I, 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 I might be the one for me, but then... I, is that a strange question? Is there a moment when you said, oh, no, this song is, this is really exciting. What's happening now? Yeah, I mean, I think the first song that we wrote together, which uh, it's a song called Growing Up. You can watch, we can watch it on YouTube. <laughs> but, uh, uh, we, we started talking about uh, our, our history together, and we kind of melded both of our stories together and wrote this song. And it, it started just like a, a night at a bar, and we had some drinks, and I took some notes, and then we kind of wrote it in, in an hour together, and it just felt kind of very magical and very real. And for a lyricist, I'm always looking for a collaborator that's willing to let me like sit on that piano bench with him and like just be in the room together. Mm. The second that like the door starts to close is the second that I feel like we're not really being able to, to communicate, and that he respects me enough that I can talk about music with my limited knowledge of it, and that he should also be able to throw out any sort of uh, lyrical ideas. Mm -hmm. I think there has to be, you know, best idea wins always, and that always mm -hmm. felt that's been the rule for the two of us, and I think that's why we've continued to work together. Mm -hmm. so. And you guys are nodding over here. What? No, everything they say is interesting and right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, Stephen and I are sort of the opposite of that. We couldn't be more different. Our backgrounds sort of couldn't She's be a more girl. different. She's a girl. Starting right there. Um, yeah. But, you know, we've, we've been working together. Last year we celebrated our 30th anniversary of working wow. together. Oh, yes. Amazing. Yes. And, yeah. I, and, and to this moment, the, the moment when we, well, we met in the BMI workshop in 1982. Um, he was a self-contained lyricist and composer and didn't need to work with anybody else. He was just this young, shy person who would get up and do these beautiful songs. And I, was, uh, I had entered the workshop as, as a lyricist, although I had um, had a career up until that point as a composer, lyricist, songwriter for television and stuff like that. But I thought, well, it's theater. You know, I, I, I've made a whole career on five chords. And I don't think that I'm going to be able to do that in theater. So I decided to just try and get in as a lyricist, which I did. And I would admire Stephen across a crowded room. I admi admired his work. And I thought, he he'll never need me. So I was sort of speed dating a lot of other composers. <laughs> you know, and, and they were all terrific. And I've remained friends with many of them. But just nothing quite clicked. And um, at the very end of that first year, uh, you know, they I don't know if any of you have been involved in the BMI workshop, but the first year there are assignments and sort of a standard array of assignments so that you learn your craft. And the last one was um, a, a song for two people in different places uh, singing together. Wasn't that a, like a duet? That's, yeah, for, it's for so, two, so just like split separate stage, but, split screen. Separate but together sort of song. Yeah. And um, I remember I was standing outside the, the, 
building, talking to a few people. And, uh, and, and at the this end is of the class. and this is like going through most of the most of the year writing my own words and music. Yeah, and he had never said re really. And said I, I had been, I had no, I hadn't. No, <laughs> so but I had admired Lynn across <laughs> across the room, and I, I I I felt that I wanted to shake things up for myself personally, you know, because I was frankly a lyricist by default. You know, I really felt that I was a composer, but I'd been writing. Uh, lyrics uh, in college and for college shows and that, but there was nobody in Cincinnati, Ohio that, you know, really wrote lyrics. So I was doing it by default. And there was the last assignment of the year, and Lynn was walking west and I was walking east, and I, and I just felt this little thing on the back of my neck say, Turn around, you schmuck. And I turned around, I screamed down the block, I said, Lynn. Do you want to work on the last assignment together? And I was so taken aback. And she, I was yeah, like, she was like, oh, he speaks. And also, our, our, our ways of working when we met were entirely different. Yeah. Lynn, Lynn uh, came from like the pop and the commercial world, and, and she's very much uh, an improv gal, like get up on your feet and like, like create it and Let's bang mm -hmm. some chords and bang see some what chords. And, and, yeah, yeah. And, and I. I, uh, I my background was very eclectic growing up in terms of my interests, but my uh, education was classical. I studied right. ed, ser serious composition at, in Cincinnati. And, and I, I thought the idea of a writer was to lock yourself away in a little cell by yourself. And I grew a beard because I thought that would help the cause. <laughs> you know, you get very, very serious, and I would score everything out, everything out on paper. So I was like very, it was much more rigid than Lynn's way of working. So she denies this, but it's absolutely true that whenever we it. finally got to her apartment for that song for the, for the end of BMI, she says, "Okay, make something up. That's Just make something That's up." That's not true. <laughs> that is true. And, and I, had, I had never written. I realized or made anything up in front of another person. I thought it was much more of a private thing. Yeah. So in a whole, a certain way, it was a dare. You know, mm -hmm. and it really pushed me out of my comfort zone. And but and I think I, had I written a lyric first because. My memory of this moment is that I had written some sort of a lyric first for a really, truly bad song that you will never hear on YouTube. <laughs> and, um, I think I put it on the piano and said, you know, see what you can make, make of this. And, yeah, make something up. <laughs> in front of me, which he had never, you know, he yeah. never worked that way. And I, but I, I will say, I remember he put his hands down and he sort of looked at it and then he just did a little this and a little that. And I thought, ah, there it is. That's who I want to work with. I did. I did have that voila moment with yeah. Stephen because he he understood lyrics and he knew how to set lyrics well, beautifully. See, see, and also Lynn has like a really musical ear. So you know, we, in a certain way, as it's developed over time, we've been one another's editors in a certain way, right. which is which is really which is really helpful. So I, I, I think that first song wasn't honestly very good, but the process of creating the not very good right. song was right. wonderful. Yeah. It was fun. And so yeah, we began we began writing together. It was it, the song was two people um, putting this is how old this was yeah. putting personal ads in the village voice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean come on. <laughs> so doesn't that just scream nineteen eighty three? It sure does. <laughs> certainly does. Yeah. Missed connections right. that's right. and talking about the their differences, which is sort of apropos when we started yeah. to work together. That was fun. You know, you guys remind, I, a question I was going to ask later, but it seems apropos now, because you guys talked about being in the room together, and obviously that first moment is being in the room together. When you work now, are you still in the room together? Are you using technology more so you're putting things on Dropbox and sharing things remotely? What's your, you know, how is your, I guess the question is, how has your process changed in 15 or 30 years? as technology has advanced? What tools are you using now that you weren't using then? It's been long enough for us that we have a shorthand. Um, it always helps if we're in the room together. Um, but if we have like an assignment that we have to get done and we're not in the same city or part of the city or just can't get together, then we'll you know, share files via Dropbox or email or whatever. Um, but uh, for the most part, our shorthand helps in in that like he can send me something and I can set four lines of it and say maybe it goes here next or we can like get sort of like a rough idea of what it's going to be even if it's just like tonally the right in the right direction so that when we can finally like get together because I feel like it always it always goes quicker when you're together. That's true. When yeah. you're in the same, you know, when you're in the same room, the same yeah. room. it always moves faster. Because like, the, the text can change and the music can change and it all can happen at the same time as opposed to being like, I'm going to be a slave to this lyric because 
they're not there or uh, vice versa. Yeah. And 90% of the time when we write songs together, it's lyric first. Um, oh. And I have learned, and I'm curious to know if, if it's the same with you guys or if it changes, uh, but uh, I have learned I mean, the biggest shortcut is that I never write a full lyric anymore because I know that the structure is going to change. And so as long as we've had a good conversation about uh, the story of the song and a possible idea for a hook or a title, I'll go away and I'll just write two sections. And I don't even call them verses or choruses. I just call them an A and a B so that we at least can distinguish between the two of them and just see what happens musically with it. Um, and Chris will, will set it, and, uh, and of course something will change, and then we'll talk through the rest of the structure. So then I'll go in and be like, all right, so we're going to put the B first, and then we'll do two A's, and then a B, and then maybe a C, and then he will kind of form the rest of the song um, while I am finishing the lyric. Right. Mm -hmm. But it, it saves a lot of time. That yeah. way. Right, if it's wasting all that time up front where you put something into a full form. Yeah, you're like, oh, I'm so proud of this wrong. like rhyme scheme, but it's not going to work anymore yeah. because the music has to do right. this. Right. So. And what about you guys? How do you find yourselves working? It, it's all different all ways. different ways. I mean, I, I couldn't even tell you what percentage of, of our work is lyrics first or music first. A lot of it is together in the same room. So once in a while it's lyrics first. I'm always pushing to get a little snippet of music because mm. I think it was, I always quote, I think it was the Bergman said that the, the words are on the tips of the notes and the minute I hear a, a, something that feels emotionally right for a moment, I can set it like that. Mm -hmm. I can just take that and run with it. It's, it, it's it almost, it almost like creating f like just musical fabric. You know, mm. like if we're yeah. talking mm -hmm. about a certain moment, I, I'll well, come up with something, I'll say, something. here's one, w one way we could go. Here's a different approach, you know, yeah. here's... The other day we were working on a song, we're working on Anastasia for the stage, that'll be our next project. Oh, right. oh, and um, uh, we're, work we're working on one particular song, and, and Stephen was doing just that, he was improvising different feelings for this one moment, and they, you know, he was unhappy with all of them, he didn't, Yeah, I, I, you know, I tried all these different approaches, and none of them felt right. right. And or, we were or, in the same room, yeah. and I said, how about a tango? <laughs> I don't know and I said, that, that makes no sense. These are Russian people. I know. <laughs> <laughs> right? I know. But then we started like I started like goofing around, and, and, and then and, and it wanted to be more lighthearted and a yeah. comedic moment. And then I came up with this dark tonality that sort of sounded like the, it could be the cousin of the tango, but it was really funny because these two characters are sneaking around the third character who's in the center, and then it became this trio that was came from a totally different place. Right. That, I said to, to Lynn, I said, I want the chorus to be like, you can't see it coming. And, right, and, and he put, just did that, and I went, oh, that's great, you know, and so we and wrote a song in about a half a day. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. That seems good. Yeah. So far. Right. But we'll, we won't be the judge of that, I don't think. But it's, but it's, been, it's, it's been really fun. There were t so many different ways to, to do it. I mean, with, with Ragtime, to get the gig, uh, we actually had to audition with other writers, you know, and there. And I think I may have told you this. There, were, we made it. We, we had to make a demo tape, and and the the assignment, if you were, or the you know, to win the prize, mm -hmm. uh, is you were given a treatment that Terrence McNally had done of, of uh, four. Well, it was a sixty-five page treatment, and then we had to write four songs, okay. and then we counted how many writing days we had to to write, arrange, record, and mix. And, and shove it and, and, the door. and say, here you go. And yeah. we, when we counted how many wa working days together we had, it was 11. Wow. <laughs> you know, days. to write four songs. And, and so produce just. Them. Well, they had to be produced. And at one point in the middle there, I was in London and Lynn was doing something. It was like really complicated. So just for that, just to be just practical, we decided two of them <laughs> would be music first. You know, and that's really just to get it done. the genesis of, of yeah. how that, you know. And what's fun is hearing how the sense of play is so important and yeah. just being willing to do something completely silly yeah. to break out of a, a stuck place, which requires the trust, obviously, to build up, and you both right. talked about that, mm -hmm. too. Exactly. Um, what do you guys do when you're stuck? No. <laughs> Smoke. Smoke. One thing is good is, is if you order Chinese food, you will usually find the solution in the fortune cookbook. Ah. Yeah. Like, that would always do that. It's like, oh, I see. But, but, you, have, but you, have, you do have to be careful with Chinese food because with talking That's about true. food combining, Lynn would say, don't eat the egg roll, don't, don't eat, eat the, the egg, egg roll, because anytime you And he do, would, and he'd fall asleep. And I'd fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> so, so stay away from the egg roll. Everybody's <laughs> writing food. Seriously, Chinese food. This is really good practical advice.
But I mean, I guess, I guess in a way, it's a larger question too, which is, uh, you know, music first or words first is part of the question everybody asks. But the bigger question is, that's not actually where you start, right? I mean, you're starting with, as you said, the story of the song, the right. understanding of the character or the moment. Or whatever. Yeah, which is why, as a, the, just from the place that I approach things musically, is I always have to have some sort of like idea of like, I mean, clear like I, I guess everybody does, but uh, the just the dramatic like what is the point of this and I and it's hard for me to come up with music for a moment that I that is just that isn't specific yet that is right. like a vague like right. is this going to be funny is this going to be right. a ballad what is this I usually have to have some sort of concrete like what approach are they feeling? What's, what's happening here? yeah even mm -hmm. if it's just like an A section or whatever and then like once that is right then I can like then I can come up with the music for the first for the next section, yeah. or the, for the rest of the song, and be like, "This is what it can, this is where it can go." But um, it always like, I don't know. It is a weird litmus test, and it and it kind of drives me crazy, and yet uh, it also is just how we work. That if if Chris can set a, my lyric fast, and it then it, the song is usually right, and the approach is usually right, and if he if he struggles. And, you, and when we're saying fast, I'm saying 30 minutes. Like, he reads it, gets it, and he has some sort of, like, feel to it. And if, if that doesn't happen, it unfortunately usually means that I have to go back to the drawing board, mm -hmm. which sucks. <laughs> sitting back, but sitting back here with your is, stopwatch, right? right. <laughs> 28 right. minutes. Like, come on, get it, get it. Come on, get it, get it, get it. New approach. Then but then again, that's why you like, only write an A, and you don't write right. the entire thing. Right. <laughs> that's very interesting. Yeah, um, uh, do you guys have to demo stuff pretty significantly when you're sending it out to other people, or are you just yeah. doing stuff piano and voice? And yeah, yeah. I'm like I, I'm am terrible at making like really elaborate demos unless I have like unless I can sit a, behind the engineer and and tell the musicians what to do. Like I can't just like do it all in Logic myself. I I can, but it takes me a long time and. When you have to do demos like that, they usually have to be done very quickly and and really well. And <laughs> mine are always kind of busted, so I have to like I usually tend to rely on piano vocal demos because I can do those really fast. But and you play guitar really well too, right? Yeah, yeah and I, I'll do that too. I haven't for a couple of years because I have a little hand problem. But, oh. but do you find it helpful? More helpful, less helpful to just like literally walk in the door, sit at the piano, and play your song. Yeah, like like the Brill Building or you know Tin Pan Alley. Yeah, and we've done that a couple. That's how we got the Tuck Everlasting job, and that's how we got another job for another show that is we're not allowed to talk about yet. But like, but yeah, mostly I feel more comfortable like going in and practicing and like it. yeah presenting it sure. because also. I mean, that's a whole other panel, a whole other conversation is like, how much do you want to, depending on who you're submitting <coughs> work to, like how much do you want to give them in terms of a fully realized thing or? Right, or it's an eternal question. Do you yeah. want them to hear a fully orchestrated thing or is that gonna scare people away because right. you've got a 30 piece string section and so right. no one's gonna wanna produce that. Yeah, or I mean, I, when we pitched Tuck to those producers, I we had written, Couple songs on guitar. I took it in and I like played it on guitar, and they were like, "That sound, that sounds too orchestrated to us. We need to hear another version of it." <laughs> and it was just wow. on guitar. <laughs> so, so I, you do? I just did a piano version, and, and they were blown away. <laughs> yeah, they were like, "That's it." And well, in like, general, okay. people like to fill in the blanks with their imagination, and when you fill it in too much, literally, yeah, yeah. they yeah. they tend when you're presenting, when you're pitching a song or a show or whatever, they they feel they want to have some input. They don't want to feel that it's done, you know. Even though it may be done, they don't want to think that. They want to think, "Oh, I can make this into this." So you, it's better in general to not fill in everything because right. they can just envision something, you know, in their mind. Mm -hmm. It's more exciting. Yeah, to so leave a little space for mm -hmm. them to feel like they can come in and mm -hmm. produce this. Yeah. yeah. Um, related mm -hmm. question, I think. Um, I, you guys have worked, uh, written book. Have you written book as well, or have you always worked with other book writers? For our thesis, I had to write 
the book Thesis at NYU. Uh, that, but then when that, that was the Burn Part Boys. Right. But then it, it went through many changes and we ended up bringing in a book writer. Right. And, and since then we have not written book, but we're about to work on a, a show together doing book. Doing yeah, book together. We've learned enough that we can, we can do it. We finally yeah. learned something yes. about the theater. <laughs> yeah, and like Stephen, when I got to NYU, I was the self-contained, out of necessity, um, writing lyrics and book and doing mm -hmm. everything. And, and mostly my first year at NYU, I was writing text until I got to, I think I did like two or three assignments where I was a composer. and. But I knew that in my second year I was going to switch over because I was like, I've had it. I don't want to write words anymore. I just want to write music. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now after 15 years, I'm like getting the itch again. So. Mm -hmm. It is interesting how all four of you come from a sensibility that's not just in your own little silo, but understanding something about words and book, you know, dr dramatic yeah. writing and music. Um, that was one I of the wonderful things about Ragtime, actually. It's um, really important. Yeah, I mean, we I've written books for probably six or seven of our musicals, um, and have just only really worked with, I think, three other book writers. Um, yeah, Joe Dart, both theater, yeah. Mm -hmm. Terrence McNally, and Tom Meehan, and yeah. Joe Darty, mm -hmm. and the rest were are my book. Um, but on Ragtime, everybody did another thing. So I was the lyricist, but I had written book. Terrence McNally was the playwright, um, but he's written operas and, and other musical forms. Um, Graziella Danielle was the choreographer, but she had directed. Frank Bellotti was the director, but he had uh, written plays. So we were just all swimming around in each other's, you know, various <coughs> excitements and, and getting such wonderful and giving wonderful, you know, sort of feedback on everything. And it's always, I think it's um, almost a necessity to understand as much as you can about everything. It, I mean, I'm one of those writers who sits in tech every moment that I possibly can because I love watching the lights and learning about that, and I love seeing how transitions are done and how sets are moved and the technical aspects of things. I, not that I know a whole lot about it, but I understand how it all works together, and I'm able to, if I have a thought, I can actually articulate it, you know, as opposed to just sort of sitting there not knowing what's wrong and, and yeah. it's, it's it's good to know. I, I'm, I'm, nothing makes me happier than being at a production meeting. Mm -hmm. When yeah. each yeah, department so talks about what to do, yeah. wow, you guys are really experts at that mm -hmm. thing. Right. <laughs> you really thought a lot about that. That's yes. so cool. Yeah. I mean, you know, I really get jazzed by that Yeah, process. no, it's exciting. I love when, you, you know, you can analyze something. Why is that song not working? I know it's a great song. I really know it in my heart of hearts, and yet it's not working. Why is that? And, and if you're able to analyze why, I mean, as an example, I occasionally mention this in Ragtime, Marin Maisie was singing the song called Back to Before. That was one of my favorite songs that we've ever written, mm -hmm. and it's a beautiful, perfect song. I don't think I could do better than that, really. That's really right up there. And she wasn't, it was just not landing. And we were trying to think, why not? And we, little by little, realized she was against a, a stormy sky, grayish green, beautiful, with some stormy clouds, wearing a grayish green, beautiful dress. Her hair was kind of all disheveled and she was singing the song. And so little by little, they put her in a white dress. They kept the stormy grayish green background, but the sun rose as she sang and gained power in the song. They fixed her hair so she didn't look like the mad woman of Shiloh. <laughs> and by the end of it, oh, and the other thing was that there was a boardwalk um, thing, a boardwalk like at Atlantic City, like upstage, and it had the ability to go up and down, and it was up through the whole song, and at a certain point, the sun rose, she came downstage, that went down, and it was like, <laughs> and she stopped the show every but, night. But and also, do you remember the entire really the entire first third she sang in profile? In profile, and then we turned her around. <laughs> yeah. And like, you know, it, and it's rough. a little bit of everybody. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. a little bit of everybody, you yeah. know, in that situation. And you have to know to say, could you perhaps have a white dress or something? You know, and, and to, to sort of notice and understand what's happening with each mm -hmm. moment is, is valuable to be able to do it. And also I think the song is really going from the darkness and going to the light. So, you know, once we knew that every aspect, it, including Echoed the back. orchestration, the arrangement, the lighting, every aspect, you know, really right, was about that. that. Yeah, and at the, at the end of it, it, sh it should be a sense of joy and a sense of relief, you yeah. know, that the actor stem is playing and, and they're all coming together. <coughs> I mean, that's, that's so. one of the challenges, but also one of the delights of our business is 
not only are you collaborating in a team of two or sometimes three, you're then working with the rest of the creative team to bring this thing to life, the actors, the musicians, the conductor, the director, choreographer, designers, to bring this thing to life on stage. Do you got, how do you guys deal with that sort of collaboration out to the rest of the collaboration? I think it's the same best idea wins um, because I, it's so easy to take things personally, especially when you're an artist because it's such an emotional thing that happens. But uh, for me, and, and I think for us, like especially when it like goes out to uh, designers and directors and all that stuff, first, like hopefully you've surrounded yourself with really smart people who are smarter than you could ever imagine. Um, and that you trust them because it's never personal. I mean, clearly in some cases it is personal, but from my perspective, like it, especially musically, it's not personal. It's like, if this doesn't work, then we must fix it. Like, so I feel like in, in all of our collaboration, like as it goes out to directors and designers and choreographers, it's the same sort of approach. Um, in my experience. Yeah. I think the, the best and most successful co collaborations we've had are people that are, are willing to be a little egoless and uh, willing to take uh, critique and ideas from the other that are, that are surrounding you. I mean, it's especially with, with Tuck that we just finished in Atlanta, we were having a really hard time with the final scene and uh, it was our set designer that came up with like the location and what needed to happen in that scene. And he just was in the room and was passionate and cared about yeah. it. And because we let him in, he solved it for us, which wow, was that's great. amazing. Yeah. Right. That's great. And that's part of it. It's that passion and the willingness to have a shared vision of what this end product has got to be. You're yeah. all in it together mm -hmm. to achieve this <coughs> thing. And if it's not getting there, then everybody can feed into that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And similarly, it seems like if, you, if you're not in it together to achieve the same thing, you're never going to get there because you're all going in different directions. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. And, and un unlike film, uh, it's done in real time. So you and your collaborators, the entire group, are making it happen in the moment as opposed to, here's, here's my cut and I'll score my film. You know what I mean? So there's, the, there's something about the shared group energy that's, that's thrilling, I yeah. think. Yeah. You know, and after, even after a difficult preview, you know, it's great just to have that arm yeah. and, and say, okay, well, yeah. That didn't go very well. So, <laughs> right. so, so what do we right. do next? And, yeah. right. you know, and, and, and I, I really love that group energy. Yeah. You know. we, we went on um, once on this island. There was one moment in the creating of that show, which I just love so much. Um, we had written a song. We had done a workshop, and there was one area, um, and I think that it was for the god of water, and his name is Agwe in the show. And Agwe had a song called Daughter of the Sea. And we staged it with ribbons of water and, you know, all this stuff. And it was very beautiful. It was and very beautiful. languid. Very languid. <laughs> and it just was terrible. And, and <laughs> so we wrote another song, which we thought might work. We didn't know. And we went over to Graziella Daniel's house. And um, when she It was has par her partially written. That was it, was. it was partially written. The song was partially written. But we had a notion for it. And we <coughs> had uh, some words and some music. And we went over there. And we're in her living room. Uh, with her upright piano, and Loy Arsenis, our set designer, was there as well. So Stephen sits down, and well, I start singing, and Stephen. The funny thing I, say, I, I was saying, it's not ready, it's not no, ready, and I'm it's going, not just ready. Do just, it. just do it, just, just so, come on. So just it, do it. so. Yeah. And it, it was fabulous because he started going, dun 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 dun. dun. Graziella's, who's you know, she gets up on her feet, starts She moving. starts dancing, and she's going, and it's like, I see it, I see it, and Loy goes. I see umbrellas, mm -hmm. and with the three of us, all like, of us, are like <laughs> dancing around the living room. The song. the song is called Rain. It's the god of water, and he's creating a flood that a car is going to crash on. And the, we were all dancing. Stephen's playing. We're all sambaing around the living room. It was wonderful. And awesome. that and is the that's what the number became. That and was the staging. Any time you see it, they do it with those umbrellas, and they do it with the same kind of movement, and it's really delightful to see. And, it. I, yeah, and it shows that you have to be willing to allow yourself to, to, to be look silly. foolish. Because I thought I thought it wasn't mm -hmm. finished, and I and I wanted to spend more time with it. Right. And it had if I had spent more time, that moment would <coughs> have happened, happened, happened in that moment. That right. wouldn't be right. in the show right. in that way. Right. I mean, that's like the beginning of your collaborative relationship right. when you're oh, yeah. thrown that's into right. this, oh no, yeah, I'm right. not ready. I'm not, <laughs> and you're just I'm not ready, ready for most things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> never going to be ready. I'm so never going to be ready, so I just surrender. Yeah. yeah, those moments you're always like about to throw up because you have to like play. That's right. This yeah. like thing you know, that isn't feeling. even fully formed <laughs> and you're just like, 
Oh, really? I just get me I out know. of here. I don't even want to do this. And then you do it, and you want to cry because you just did you something. Made and yourself, yeah. And it was wonderful. And then they're like, "Yes, that's it. That's yeah. it. Yeah, it's that's perfect. It. Yeah." You know, you know, I asked you guys to think about a moment that was a collaborative hurdle or a challenge and maybe share some of that with us. Um, I don't know if you did or not. Probably he's going to say, no, actually, we're going to play a great song that we wrote. But I thought, it, I just thought, I mean, it, it's obvious you've written great songs. Uh, we know some of those great songs. We've heard those great songs. We know the success. And I just thought, how do, we, how do we share with people something about how you navigate the moments that are not working? And come out with something. So, do you want to play or sing something and talk about that? Sure. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Right. Good. <laughs> Who wants to go first? Well, we have, we have a before and after that we oh, can. Oh, perfect. That we can great, do. great, great. And they're both like two and a half minutes. So. Wonderful. It's very short. Yeah. Tell us. About uh, okay. <laughs> so we're gonna do uh, songs from Tuck Everlasting. Uh, so Tuck Everlasting is uh, a very popular young adult uh, novel. Uh, it's celebrating its 40th anniversary this year. It's about an 11 year old girl who runs away from home and meets a family that is immortal, that has been living forever. And she goes on this journey with this family. And at the end of the story, she is uh, posed with the question, will I drink from this spring and have an immortal life or will I embrace my own, my own mortal life? And uh, so that's, that's kind of big heavy questions in this show. Um, and we're gonna play you one of the heavier moments, which is one that we have we just we picked it because I think we've rewritten this song more than any other song in the show. Um, and this is for Miles Tuck. So there's a family of four, the Tucks. There's Ma Tuck, Ma Tuck, Pa Tuck, and then there are two kids, Jesse and Miles. Uh, Miles is 30 years old, and he's been 30 for about 80 years, so he's 120. And of all of the Tucks. Uh, when we first meet him, he's he's sarcastic, he's cold, he's a little dangerous, um, where the rest of the Tucks are very warm and welcoming to this little girl. Uh, and you find out about uh, three quarters through the act one, we finally find out why he's been so standoffish. And what we discover is that of all the Tucks, before he drank the water, he had a family. He had a, a, a wife and a child. And by the time they put it together that they were immortal um, and his family hadn't drank the water, uh, it was too late. His, his, his wife was uh, quite a bit older. His son was, uh, was old too. And he, they didn't know where the spring was. Anyway, basically, his mother, his wife took his child and they left. Uh, and so this was a song moment to, uh, that he's explaining that to Winnie. I hope I did an okay job yeah. explaining that. <laughs> All right. Um, so... We, we, we went two different directions with it. Um, and we're going to play you. We had written a song, and, and then we decided, all right, let's try another direction. Let's try a different, a different color. Uh, just yeah, because we thought all it was the a little too heavy. Yeah, and all of the workshops, whenever he would come forward and sing the song, it was like, oh, another ballad. Come on, dude. <laughs> and, um, and so we were like, let's... Uh, Let's approach it from a different angle and see if we can't like. At the, and there were there were like two other versions of the song too. That it's like a whole. We could do a whole night of versions of this song. <laughs> <laughs> so this is sort of three or four iterations into uh, three or four yes. third or fourth attempt at getting this yes. right. Yeah. Yeah. So this is not the successful version. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then we'll play you what we think is the successful. Version. The one that actually worked with an audience. And yeah, yeah. But this is what we brought to Atlanta, thinking this is going to be a show, everyone's going to love it, it's a different sound, and it just, well, I won't be the judge. So this is Miles singing to Winnie. You'll fall in love, you'll say a vow, you'll ask yourself, Until you're hated or for 
that we wanted we just wanted to try to have it a little lighter but like it was like a jazzy bluesy feel but what we realized is that the song should really be about his backstory it shouldn't be about the drinking and the booze and like I'm over this it needs to be about I lost this child um, so we really can kind of feel the gravitas of uh, <coughs> what Winnie is going to be forced to, to make this decision at the end of the show also we realized that placement uh, in the show um, we were really worried that it was a ballad, but once we then moved a song before that that had this fantastic dance break, and everyone was very, it was like a ragtimey kind of tune, yeah. it was okay, and we finally earned this more serious moment, which we will now present to you as Exhibit B. <laughs> and the scene, he explains to Winnie that his uh, son is named Tom. I had a farmhouse with a grandfather clock where I would teach time to my son. Our lessons began at 12 o'clock sharp when the hands would come in his walk. I'd say the big hand counts minutes, it's so tightly wound, it chases the small. Constellations in the sky. How to tell a silver maple from a cottonwood. I taught Thomas to divide and multiply, but what he never understood was time. As I watched him grow, time, he would never know time where my regret resides. Time, if I only.
our guest that one stayed. Yeah. 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 People really liked it. It deserves its place right there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you realize that that's what you want to know that information. You want to want to understand why he's being mean to this little girl and like and then once he tells that story everyone feels for him in this amazing way. And we also had the amazing Robert Lindsay uh, play the role and he just was yeah, he perfect. Was he could like handle kind of both sides of that character mm. in the best way. Beautiful. So, yeah. he was great. I love the parts of the accompaniment that remind us of a ticking clock yeah. without mm. being obviously mm -hmm. that. Bing, 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 right, bing. right. But you know, just, <laughs> the, the, just this thing come back to this pulse that sits there. I also love it hearing the two songs the way time is part of the hook one way or the other. But it, yeah, yeah. You probably have a page of all the phrases using time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yes. yes I do. Um, I'd love to actually book. give a chance. If pe do people have questions for Chris and Nathan about that material and that process? Just to open it up here before Stephen Lynn says something. Sure. Yeah. Did it ever occur to you to just rewrite the lyrics for to the song to have the, the different context? Instead of trashing the entire song, I mean, I thought both songs were really good. Okay, thank you. Did everybody? Can everybody hear the question? Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, I think we did that. I think we did like. I think we tried it from like every possible angle. And I mean, sometimes we sometimes we tend to jump the gun and be like, let's just write a new song, and then sometimes we'll try it as many ways as possible so we don't have to write another song. Mm -hmm. um, and with that one in particular, I mean, there were like so many versions of it um, that it became hard to tell what was, especially when you're rewriting something constantly, it, you, you start to lose sight of like what that, where the song started and what the song actually is and what it should be. Um, and I think just tonally, it would be very weird for him to tell the story of his of his mm -hmm. son and what happened with that kind of jazzy, bluesy. Because I think everything in that first song, he's just throwing it away, saying, "This is not. It doesn't hurt me. This doesn't hurt me." Where the second version is is very earnest, and mm -hmm. you just kind of have to like go for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but there were. I fell. In, I've fallen in love with many, many time lines, and. There was just a time where I just kept, there was a time when I just kept giving him the same words over and over and over again because I, I you know, I love the idea of like I'm left with nothing but time. I was like, this is really great. And there was a song called Left With Nothing But Time. And then you're like, no, it should just be the last line of the, of the thing. So at some point you just have to give new information if you're, if you're swimming and you're stuck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other questions from these guys? Oh, yeah. but to continue with what you were saying, so if you're integrating the book, um, so in your first um, version, where did you then, in the book, basically did the, allow the character to reveal what the real problem was? In other words, you had to figure out then how to change the book with the song, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah, so it was just add, with the first song that we presented, it was adding all these additional beats because he had to explain the whole story before he could sing the song. And then he sang the song and then she had to then change him in some way, because that was kind of the, the rule for the show is that any time Winnie is with one of the individual tucks, she has to change him for the better in some way or another. So then we also had to have that moment, um, and then which was in the middle of the song, and it was clunky, and then we had the final, the final moment. Yeah. Um, where now, in the new version, he could kind of hint at what happened, tell the story, let the song, and, uh, uh, connect to her and that right at the end of the song she just said um, I lost my father when I was 10 I will love him and miss him forever because his whole worry is that will my son even remember me and she says that to him and and he says they're about to go to the fair and he says go and have everything and he gives him all the gives her all the money that he has in her pocket and she goes to the fair and has a wonderful time mm -hmm. but that was then solved with you know four lines instead of 20 lines Mm -hmm. He's almost already made the change journey mm -hmm. simply by singing the song, and she just yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. unlocks the last piece. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and he also, I think we had we had had her leave at some point in the previous version. He sang the yeah. song, and when he had left, so he was just singing the song to the audience, which is you know like give him someone mm -hmm. to share this with, and also let Winnie hear the story. 
So it's funny that like that was an epiphany, but it was. I mean, there was probably a full year of the draft of this. Yeah, song. I mean, there was a whole version of the song with him like te- actually teaching the, a little boy, and his and the wife like coming in, and then there was a chorus of ladies that sang with it. <laughs> yeah, and then it was a soap opera. It was yeah, yeah it, was, it was a whole. You're like, done good. Yeah, you did the right thing. Yeah. Um, Stephen and Lynn, would you share something? Some, uh, um, you know, we, we will. It's not. It won't be as, <laughs> as fabulous as that. Um, oh. But you know, the, the, what I was thinking in, from your question and listening to that was that, for my money, a lot of the struggle that you have in writing musicals is not so much the song, but the structure mm-hmm. of the show, mm-hmm. because you can take a perfectly wonderful song, and if it's in the wrong part of the the musical, it will get cut. Yep. And, you know, we have a number of songs, not a number, not a big number, but a certain number of songs that have, have been in the wrong place, been fabulous songs, and have been cut because they just, we couldn't find the right place to put them. And we've gotten a lot more savvy about that as we've gone on. But I, I, that to me, and probably because I am a librettist as well as a lyricist, that to me is always the biggest challenge, is, is getting the... the, the Pearls in the right order on the string, or however you mm-hmm. want to put that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, it affects the. It can take a brilliant song and make it not work, or it can take an, an okay song and elevate it into something amazing. And uh, notes are being passed. <laughs> it just says you're doing great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, I just I just wanted to add that uh, you know because a lot of the time I mean we we have several shows. Well, um, we, we were we've just been rehearsing a, a man of no importance, which which is a show yeah. that we did at Lincoln Center, and we're we're going to be doing it in uh, right before uh, St. Patrick's Day. Fifty four below. Fifty four oh, below. October fifteenth. Oh, right. And I, I bring it up yeah. because there's a song that works so well in the show, and originally it was it was sung by a secondary character and was right. placed in Act One, never worked, and we cut, cut it. it, and then uh, we were trying to structure uh, Act Two, and we knew that there had to be an event or a moment. Where this all started adding up for this, ca- the lead character, and, and one of them, w- uh, Litman says, "What about that number that the old guy sang, the Cuddles number? <laughs> we love Bring that, that out of the trunk." And whenever we placed it with him remembering his wife uh, and, and how love never dies, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, but he's remembering the, the wife, and all of a sudden that motivates Alfie to for the next scene. But love. then, and, and not only did, was it a great moment and an unexpected moment. Uh, but it really motivated the entire rest of the act. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, what were we thinking of? Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. So yeah, it's a, it's it, that to me is the biggest. Challenge. It wasn't the song. It's it was not the song. I mean, we function. you know I feel like we can all just write songs till the cows come home because that's what we love <coughs> to do. That's our joy. You know, we yeah. love we just love getting in a room and sitting yeah. at a piano or with a guitar and just inventing songs. That's such a joy. The the hardest part is is the structure. That's really the hardest part, and if that's not right, the songs will never be right. And if that is right, you get away with a lot yeah. because <laughs> you know you're telling a good story, yeah. and it's it's about storytelling. Um, you know, I was I was going to say we one of the hardest um, shows that well, there were two shows that were very very difficult to write for us, and I happened to write book for both of them. One was the Glorious Ones, and one was Dessa Rose, which we both of which were done at Lincoln Center, and both of which I think are two of my favorite shows that we've ever worked on. But getting there, I mean, the Dessa Rose took 10 years of just trying to convince Stephen that we should do this show. <laughs> and then I finally had no, her... No, I, 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 found, I found the source material really, really problematic. It was beautifully written, but it was so dense and gnarly, and, and there's a lot of anger in it, and there's a lot... It was just really hard. And it was written in a dialect that, you know, it had, like, so many things, for my money, going against it. And yet... Lynn said, the ending is so is amazing. so amazing. But it's like, yes, but you have to get to the ending, you know? <laughs> so I come following off years. that one. Ten and she, years. she brought it to me, I think, in like 92. <coughs> I don't know. Yeah. And, and then she kept, like the little dog, you know, like I'm, I'm a little she, kept, tenacious. she kept being tenacious. Oh, and she said, read it, read it. And I, I think I, I think I wouldn't have been able to write Dessa Rose had I not done Ragtime. And whenever mm-hmm. I did mm-hmm. that, uh, it became, in a certain way, a c- companion piece. And and I and I read it again. I said, "This is really beautiful." It, I, I said, "I still, n- I know you have a vision for it, and I, I can't, I, I can't grasp that because I can't get it myself." I said, "Can you just somehow put your vision on paper?" And she pretty much wrote uh, what felt like an opera lo- libretto, you know, pretty much like a folk a- opera for pretty much an act and some other little bits and pieces. And 
this is one of the rare instances where I then went away right. and I was away for a chunk of time and I said it. And, well, and, and, and you everything. know, because because usually, yeah. honestly, you know, it's a yin and yang thing, or yeah. or it's like here's a piece of music, or here's a scrap of, and this was like here's an act of material, you know. Cool. It's like, and, and I just went out, and then I wanted to like stew on it, and I went to I went to wait for like some sort of weird moment in nature that would say, now I'll get to the piano and write it. And I was just thinking and thinking and dreaming, and then there's this electrical storm, so I moved candle, candles and my little battery powered recorder, and I said, idea for seven. And this thing just came out like wow. like a torrent. Yeah. And I said, uh, after being away for a while, I, I, I said to Lynn, I said, let's get together. I have 15 minutes of music we've never heard. And, and yeah. we got That's together. Amazing. And That's then amazing. once we got it, but I was able to see what her vision is, and I was able to respond in my way to that. And then we got together, and then we crafted the rest of it like we always did. You know, yeah. we took things But it took 10 years. To get there, <laughs> you know, there those are the the hurdles in, in yeah. you know the the glorious ones were sort of similar. It took a long time, and I just couldn't figure it out. And every summer, I would sit down and write a new draft, and they were in verse. And I, there, I have different summers of the glorious ones. This is an iambic pentameter. This is like people, people. This is couplets. I couldn't. Wow. I, it, it didn't end up in verse at all. I mean, people <laughs> a, people ask how how long it took us to write the show, and it was produced in two thousand and seven. And all I would say is, let me put it this way, in the first reading of The Glorious Ones, <laughs> the ingenue was Donna Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a crazy love. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. but, but it started out as, as a large, it's very Candide-like. It's, it's like the merry pranks of this, this little it's like, it's a, theater. It's based on Comedia, right? Comedia. Comedia. And they go mm -hmm. here to and here. And changing, changing yeah. theater. And, and, and there's so many incidents into it. So originally we wrote it with like large scale, with big chorus. With the troop traveling, and you know they meet the you, 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 they meet these people and those people, and and that it just really really didn't work. Yeah. And then and then we, we did then Lynn's best one is that uh, iambic pentameter version. Which <laughs> I was going to bring one, and I thought this is too humiliating. Yeah. And, and anyhow, <laughs> what, what what it wound up being is uh, it wound up being a, sh a show about a troop. And there were eight members of the troupe, and they performed all of the hundreds of roles and in their oh, style of theater. Yeah. And it was really wonderful. So we thought that's that's what it should be. But then ultimately, we, we were writing and trying to set on paper a show that's about theater that's not written down. So think of that. You know, it's about improvisation. Mm -hmm. So we knew that we had to get f f funny actors and creative people in a room, and we just sort of had this like comedia workshop, and we built a lot of it using those ideas because it just seemed crazy trying to come up with a draft on paper about right. theater. To let it be created mm -hmm. the way that you yeah. Want. And yeah. so it was. It was wonderful. So that. these are the these are the hard parts. Is you know just figuring out that the the what it is, mm -hmm. and once you figure out what it is, then you try to figure out how do we dole that out when we know what the story is, and and in what order do we dole it out, and where do these moments come, and you know th so yeah. you know and, and, and also the how to you know because because yeah. the other thing about yes. Dessa Rose, the thing that really changed for us, it became about uh, it came about. Uh, storytelling and, and, and telling one's own story because these two women that are the central characters in the novel, they don't meet until very late in the game. So we thought you can't have one start and then the other major character doesn't enter till there. So we had to find some way that they could be in the opening number and throughout. And right. So it became an oral history, oral basically, history. telling about slavery and, and the adventures of two women who, who actually lived and, um, uh, you know, Went on this journey together, and anyway, I mean, these are right, these right, are just no, examples I, I, of, of craft and. It's just you know. I mean, the, the common theme is sometimes you're there in the details trying mm -hmm. to work it out, and you realize you've got to take several steps back and realize and see the whole. It has nothing mm -hmm. to do with this detail. That's exactly where this fits right. in the whole thing. That's exactly right. I, I even love the you know we, we talked about shared vision, right? That's so, so important to be seeing the same thing, mm -hmm. and with uh, Dessa Rose, how you could never see what I Lynn saw. Until you sort of took it away from the source material, right. made sort of here is what I see, right, Stephen, exactly. and then you went off and right. came back. He was I, hoping I wouldn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> he was hoping, but I no, I, no, no, but no, but it's but it's interesting. I don't think I was ready to do that show. Yeah. I think I think it was a tough show. I, I think whenever you go through the years, you you guys know this as as a team. It's like you're developing as individuals, but also you're developing as a team. And I think in 1992, I would have written a really or Dessa Rose. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I don't think I had it in me yet, and I don't I didn't think I had flexed enough muscles to be able to write that show, and it and it was and it was really intense subject matter, and I don't think I would have been able to do that without Ragtime, which happened, you know, right. six years later, mm -hmm. right. you know, and then and then that, that emboldened you in, in me in a certain way, and 
and uh, you know, yeah, yeah. so I, I, you know, I think I think and the same thing with same thing with the glorious ones. It's really about two generations of theater. There, it's about like the old guard and the young Turks. And the old guard is you know the the guy who's the improvisational guy, and the young Turk is is creating this totally new kind of theater. Yeah. And when we started writing that show, I totally identified with that young Turk. You know, and, and I was able to nail that part, and I could never fully get into the head of the other guy. And then, of course, 13 years pass, <laughs> right. and then you know more about that yeah, character. Right, right, so right. In, a, in a certain way, I think it was a blessing that it took that long, because mm -hmm. because I was able to look at the characters and live with them and, you know, know, know more about yeah, that yeah. stuff. Have another sure. way to get into that, too. Um, questions for Stephen and Lynn? Uh, when the book writer was the third collaborator, mm -hmm. Can we talk a little about that? Peter Stone complained to me that the lyricists always stole his best scenes. That's right. And not only that, but they got royalties on it, and he didn't. Right. <laughs> Can we talk about the the third collaborator? Right. Yeah, right. absolutely. We're, we're working with the third collabor collaborator right, right, right now. We're right doing now. our third show with Terrence McNally at the moment. That wow. He's writing the book to Anastasia. <clears throat> and, you know, you have to be a generous person to be a book writer because... Um, that's correct. The lyricist's job is to steal all of the highest emotional points and best <laughs> scenes and turn them into lyrics. And if you have a problem with that, be a playwright. You know? <laughs> um, that's, it's really true. A musical is a collaboration. As far as royalties, that's a whole, you know, songs are songs. There's a whole other structure for paying for songs on records or, you know, whatnot. But in the theater, it's all favored notions. Everybody gets exactly the same thing. So, you know, if you want to complain about that, be a playwright. You know, I, you know, it's just it's it's one of those things. But Terrence happens to be one of those very rare playwrights who not mm -hmm. only is generous with his work but understands musical structure. Um, there are playwrights we've had a few run-ins, not run-ins, but you know, a few experiences with a few of them who are wonderful playwrights and can't write a musical, just can't relinquish their work, can't don't understand musical structure and flow, don't understand rhythmic progression. There are a lot of, it's, it's an, almost an intuitive thing, and um, Terrence, we're very lucky that he's our friend and our collaborator, because he's fantastic and, and, in, in and, all of those ways. And he actually encourages Lynn. He, he overwrites, he overwrites and, he, and, and he get, he'll write like a mm -hmm. big soliloquy, and give, give it to, to Lynn, encouraging mm -hmm. her, use what, what anything that's in mm -hmm. there. And you, you, you know, and like, uh, like the song Goodbye My Love, Goodbye, my love. God bless you, and I suppose bless America too. That's that was Terence's speech. And I just said, "That's a she lyric." Just, yeah. <laughs> oh, I, oh, and I, I, I think I think I just started setting the music, and then I kept going from there with the idea, and you know, then Lynn was, you know, setting it, and then we we knew that there had to be a, a change of heart or a change of mind in the middle of it, and then the music shifted that way, <laughs> and you know, if 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 the music can su surprise you and you're supposedly in the dri driver's seat and you go, whoa, where'd that come? Then chances are you can surprise the audience. And, yeah. and that's what it is. So much of it is about like, surprising the audience, yeah. staying ahead yeah. of the audience. Yeah. And who's the book writer on Tuck, Everlasting? Claudia Shear. Claudia Shear, right. Mm -hmm. And she, she, you know, it's a magical, mysterious job being a book writer. And, and everything that Lynn said is right. It's like it's... It's totally intuitive, and if and if the playwright doesn't understand, you know, musical structure and all that stuff, it just like becomes torture. And Claudia, we're lucky Claudia does like she, she's really great and um, understands all of those things. Yeah. So. I saw her um, perform at Playwrights Horizons. I, I'm forgetting the name of the show, but the one with all her different jobs. Yeah, and alongside yeah, alongside through, life. through life. Alongside yes. ways through life, yeah. and I <laughs> felt it was a musical without any singing. Yeah. Huh. It just had this. Flow and this arc to it, and there were just arias of words. That were, I thought it was sensational. Yeah, yeah she really just brilliant. and she too was very. We we did an event, and she explained being the book writer as the dirt from which the, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the every uh, everything blossoms. Yeah. The rich loamy soil, yeah. That's right. <laughs> right. the <laughs> nutrients. She's like it's thankless, and you get blamed for everything, but then. You're also like the foundation and the bones, yeah. 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 The bones mm -hmm. from which everything springs. So. There was a, um, Chris and Anthony, there was a question from Twitter uh, oh, whether that's there's awesome. a. Oh. Yeah, see, that's what the it's secret yellow card is. <laughs> um, is there a cast album for Tuck Everlasting? Not yet. Not yet. Not yeah. yet. Hopefully there, there will be. Are there, there's nothing even on your website from that show? I, didn't, I, was like, I mean, there are like random YouTube. 
there's yeah, some cool recordings. YouTube performances. Everything is on YouTube. Yeah. You're yeah. Both yeah. <laughs> but but hopefully there will be a cast album. Yes. Okay, good. Um, I'd love to open it up for other questions that people might have. Yeah, down here. Yes, I'm curious about the process in, in the early formative stage where you're working book writer, director, uh, other key uh, uh, participants, and you're looking to, to find a, uh, a particular sound and feel to the, to the project. Now, Ragtime, of course, because of that, mm -hmm. had its own setting, and the music took on mm -hmm. that nature. But, you know, sometimes it's not as obvious, maybe with Tuck Everlasting, uh, you know, what was the thought process about what style will the music have? Does that affect the way you come up with lyrics and rhyme schemes and so forth? So just to kind of get a sense of what is that preliminary thought and creative process to figure out the, the tone of a, of a musical. Mm -hmm. You know, just I'll, I'll just say one quick mm -hmm. thing because I'm not, a, you know, a composer in that sense, but um, Howard Ashman, mm -hmm. um, always said that he, in his opinion, every project needed to have some inherent musicality, um, some inherent musical style. I don't know if I would go that far, uh, but it sure helps, you know. And, um, you know, when you look at the many shows we've done, the only one that I don't think had its own inherent style maybe was Susical, which was more of an invented Oh, world. well, you know, you know, it was interesting because Susical was the show that we wrote right after Ragtime. And there's something about when you're writing for a particular locale at a, during a particular time, and even though it's different groups of people which allow you for a variety within that, you're, you're really trying to capture your vision and, and your, your, your take on that world. But for Susical, it was, it was you could make up anything. And so like, right. so the people that lived in the jungle, I thought, oh, it could be cool, that could be, could be urban jungle. So, so, there's, so there's like kind of like, like R and B and you know like hip hop and soul and you know there's like uh, uh, there when during the chase scene I, I thought oh this could be fun it could be like those like streets of San Francisco mm -hmm. and those like those TV shows from the seventies and I was like just yeah, a little Aretha Franklin in yeah, there Ar it Aretha's sort of there. lent itself to anything but then the other worlds were other were other things like the Who's were um they they were sort of like Spike Jones was yeah, what I was yes, thinking yeah, of yeah. like this little odd thing and so y y I think the composer had, does have to make choices but I, I think it certainly had its own sensibility. It did, but you know, a lot of our other shows, the glorious ones, were set in, in uh, 17th century Italy. So there's an Italian sound that you find. Little Dancer has a, a classical French sound to it, the show we just did. Um, you know, they all somehow embody something. I think probably Tuck Everlasting would ha have some. Yeah, the challenge know. with Tuck was that it, like, it, it was like a turn of the century New England setting, and um, the turn of the last century. So. Uh, researching that kind of music it's like hmm it's just kind of like do you really want a musical to sound like this for an entire especially a, a contemporary musical um yeah. so you know in in having the great uh fortune to have casey nicola in the room with us when we first started working on the piece we would i as the composer would like try a bunch of different things and we finally settle on this sort of otherworldly folk sound where it sounds like uh, it's it's you can't quite put your finger on what this folk music is. It's it's like is it Celtic? Is it Scottish? Is it uh, is it Irish? Is it country music? What is it? And uh, and so it became this sort of like melting pot of different like folk styles while still like uh, giving you some period uh, New England stuff at the same time. And um, but we all. You know, you just have to like totally. jump in and yeah. make and those choices. Something. And yeah. if it's like totally wrong and and anachronistic, <coughs> sometimes that's even a choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But and sometimes that works. Well, look at Hamilton. Uh, I was going to say, as right. Hamilton yeah. appears yeah. to be proving right now, you right. can yeah. Yeah. go completely anachronistic yeah. and get to the heart of a story. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But for example, when you did the two versions and you did a kind of the first one, was definitely had this kind of bluesy dream. Did, mm -hmm. that, did that also fit into the scheme that you're talking about, about this other world, or did it sort of stick out of where did this come from, from a, a musical sensibility? I think it's a little bit of both with that particular one. Mm -hmm. That one that one was an attempt to uh, go in a more like a saloon type direction for that particular character. Um, 
and then when what we settled what we settled on and what's there now is sort of in that more open universe of where does this actually fit? Um, and and I, I think you what you said like really struck a chord with me. You don't want to be so slavish to uh, any particular style. Like even little, little Dancer mm -hmm. that we did, like it's set in eighteen eighties world of the ballet in Paris. And you know, so I listen to a lot of that ballet music, and in fact, it ends with the ballet, and we have a, a lot of dance in it. But at the same time, the younger characters, uh, I, I, I wanted them to appeal, and so younger mm -hmm. people today could understand and relate mm -hmm. to them. So their material is much more pop-like, mm -hmm. and so trying to trying to find a way to have the classical world and the pop world exist, yeah. that actually became the the cool and challenging thing, mm -hmm. not only in the writing, but then when we got in there to do the orchestration. You yeah, because I said I don't want a rhythm section, even though it has these kind of rhythms, and mm -hmm. so we we so so we played around and found interesting you know ways of stitching it all together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in it's the end, scary, but it's the, also fun. It's fun. Yeah. the yeah. music still fun. sounds like you're writing. Yeah, absolutely. You know what I mean? It, it, you're not so slavish to no. the period and the style that you're just going to be somebody else. Right. It still yeah. also has to filter back through you, as the words do as well. The words are true to the period and the time, but the way you're putting it together is yours, not just. Yeah, I mean, we, every time, I, and I always try to do it, but it never works. It's like every time, especially in Tuck, uh, when there was an opportunity to write something that was like really like a gay 90s type like period tune, we got one in there. And uh, every time they sang it, like the odd, not, not in this recent production, but in like readings and work, previous readings and workshops, the, odd, the people at the readings and workshops would be like, oh, come on. Um, so, you know, they would go and <laughs> find a way to like get that period stuff in other tunes while still acknowledging the contemporary yeah, audience, audience sensibility. Yeah. Um, I know you guys have to take off uh, and we're almost at 8 o'clock. Um, can we take a, one? Other questions yeah, let's happen. take another question. Well, I don't know. Did you guys want to play we, anything? We, we have. We gave you that opportunity. Yeah. 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 That was this great story. Don't leave well, us we, we, have a, we, have a, we have a little something, <laughs> and 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 uh, this just th this is off of ragtime. I think that's a, an interesting oh, one because cool. everybody says what comes first, the words or the lyrics, yeah. or the words and the music. And and with this one, this is one of the the two that where I started, where it was like music first. And it was, and it's the end of Act One, and we'd write our four songs, and uh, it started with music first, and it's after the character of Sarah uh, is is murdered in a public place, and there's an outpouring of grief from all over the all over the country, right. and uh, so uh, I wrote a, I wrote a song that would become uh, till we reach that day. I wrote the music for the thing, and it's and, and it's set in uh, Sarah, at Sarah's funeral, and I played it. For, for Lynn, and uh, she, she said, you know, she said, it sounds very hopeful. And I said, well, I think, I, you know, I think the music would be hopeful. I think it would have that sense of hope, and even though there's rage under it. And she said, but, <coughs> she said, but you, there, there's rage. There's rage, there's anger, there's point of view. So in other words, somebody reading about this incident in the paper versus Cole House, who's in shock from, from seeing that himself, to Emma Goldman, who would have heard about it on the street, and is and said, of, well, "How could they beat a woman?" You know, and mm -hmm. the women's mm -hmm. issues, and there are all these different points of view, which sounded really cool. So I'm just, I'll just play two little themes, and then I have a bit of a surprise. <laughs> a cool thing. Oh, uh, I have a feeling it's this. I'm not I know. Sure. I don't know what, what is that? that? Is. There's a surprise. I don't know. Over here. <laughs> I don't think it's a lot. So, so, that, so, so, so what I brought to Lynn was pretty much this. Uh, I, I don't even know that this is the theme. Uh, Not that I feel like singing them because it's not in my range or anything, but it's there's a day of peace, a day of pride, a day of justice we have been denied. Um, let a new day dawn, O oh Lord, I pray. We'll never get to heaven, heaven till we reach that day. 
So it's very, it's a gospel hymn in a way, mm -hmm. sung at a funeral. And, and so then we began yeah. to talk about the, the idea of the points of view, which was a really cool and interesting idea, which allowed us to go into individual heads. Now that, that came from, from Lynn, we're just responding to the piece of music that really didn't have a lyric to it yet. And so when, so when we began uh, uh, working on that, I, I thought there is a really dark and ghostly uh, idea of a ragtime that maybe could go as a counter line. So it was this. <laughs> singing there's a day of peace a day when justice will come and till we'll never get to heaven until we reach that day there are people over here singing what they did to her what they took from her she had life in her lord she had my baby look what they left of her left of her left of my girl very angry very dark and emma goldman singing you know and they well, beat her and beat her and beat her and it's all going against this hymn so, so, so what, what I brought in, because we were talking about demos earlier, so I brought yeah. in the demo that we did for the Oh, team. our first demo. Oh, no. yeah. yeah, and so this is yours truly playing the piano, and this is at a studio that had no, what's, nope. that, what's that called? Mixing board? No, Automation. No, no. Automation. Uh, Automation. Uh, so there were, we, all lined we were up all pushing the faders, uh, and we had our friends, oh, we had our friends singing. We had and, our friends singing, yeah, so this is crazy. Chuck Cooper as Cole House Walker. And uh, many uh, Michelle Pox in there. Yeah, there's and, tons of and, people. And whenever I listen to it, I, we, we could never rep we kept the exact vocal arrangement for the production. It's wow. a, pretty close to what we wound up with. But we can never, I can never replicate the excitement. I thought, what was the hidden ingredient that is on that that's on this that you're about to hear that we never got into the show? And then I remember it's. Billy Porter uh -huh. singing the alto part, ah. and then at one point doubling the soprano. Right. So, we're trying to be, so listen, listen, these women sing, Even and then that's Billy Porter. Knew. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This was when we, this was our audition. One of our yeah, audition Yeah, so this is the songs. audition. Yeah. We, we got very ambitious. Yeah. And we, yeah, did, really. we did the big moments. Yeah. I guess it worked. It, it yeah. Worked. I mean. Okay. Let's let us know up or down volume wise. I'm excited to hear this. It's Sounds like trouble. Yeah. 